I'm super excited you're joining us for this uh, Christmas series called Hope. But first, I want to take a few moments and thank those of you who participated in our Be Rich to Others uh, outreach uh, campaign. You guys are just fantastic. Thank you for helping us to impact in the name of Jesus Christ the lives of tens of thousands of adults and kids, both across the Bay Area, across the country, and the world. Because of you, we were able to make the love of Jesus Christ real and tangible in the lives of many. So thank you so very much. Well, I'm super excited about teaching this series, and so let's jump into this uh, passage of Scripture found in Matthew uh, chapter 1, and let's get, let's get busy. Now, we're cutting into the middle of a story. Of course, this is a story about Joseph and Mary. Here's what the writer says. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement that he had with Mary quietly. There's the reading. Listen, guys, if there ever was a time that we need to figure out how to engage and access a relevant and living hope, it's now. The fact of the matter is that our lives are surrounded by hope killers. For example, the rate of disease and death and dying that's all around us is staggering. The sense of grief and loss is certainly overwhelming. The pace of change that is happening in our culture, in our climate, in our local communities are just, it's just breath, breathtaking. And the love of toxicity that's multiplying all around us is mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing, I tell you, to watch, for example, here in America, certain politicians who will do anything necessary just to consolidate their power. It doesn't matter how many people that they hurt or wound. It's, it's, it's horrifying to watch, for example, uh, a young man in Michigan go into the school and kill a couple of his classmates I mean, and, and wound others. And, 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 and add to that, gangs of folk who are going from store to store here in the Bay Area, these high-end stores, just breaking in, breaking glass, stealing, you know. This is horrible toxicity that is surrounding us all, making life deadly, making life dangerous. I tell you, really hope killers. For example, I heard this past Thursday that the President of the United States convene a virtual meeting with 100 leaders of democratic nations all over the world so that they could discuss about the fact that it appears that democracy is under attack all over the world. Yeah, hope killers. Yeah, I, I didn't name all the stuff that may be going wrong in your life. There, there are a thousand, way, a thousand and one ways that hope is actually being in a sense, murdered in our lives. If there ever was a time we need a sense of hope, it's now. Thank God for Christmas. Can somebody say thank God for Christmas? Yes, thank God for Christmas. Thank God for the Christmas season, guys, because the Christmas season, at the very heart of it, is this incredible story of a God who loves you and me so much that he becomes one of us so that he can redeem us and provide hope in a broken and toxic world world. So here's the first point I want you to get as we, as, we, as we make our way into this series. Here's the first point. You might want to take a picture of it right here on the screen. Hope ultimately resides in the presence and the person of a living God. If, if, if God exists, then there is hope. There is no God, then we're just kind of wheeling through the universe aimlessly and hopelessly. But if God exists, and I declare God exists, Christmas is about a God that exists not only out there, but who actually becomes a part of us. So here's the point. Engage in the presence of God in our lives. You know what it, ha- what, what it does? It acknowledges that we are participating. Oh, this is insightful. Now lean in. We are participating in something bigger. It suggests that our story is not at the center of the universe. It suggests that, that our story, that life does not begin and end with your story, with my story. That in fact, there's a bigger story that we are a part of. You know, the other day I was uh, watching on the news as William Shatner 
used to be one of my favorite actors. You know, he was, he's my favorite, all-time favorite captain in all of the different Star Trek series, where the, the initial Star Trek, Star Trek series, he was uh, Captain Kirk, James T. Kirk. I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched all those episodes. Well, recently in his mid to late 80s, he had an opportunity on, uh, on the, the spaceship that the Amazon owner, uh, Bezos, uh, sent a spaceship up and put some people on it. And William Shatner got to go up into space for real, for the very first time on Blue Origin. And um, I, I was listening to some of his comments after he uh, landed and was giving some interviews. And he says that one of the things that struck him was, uh, as he looked from space at Earth, he realized, really, for the very first time, just how small we human beings truly are in terms of the vastness of space. And he realized, in some sense, even the planet, how small it is in terms of the vastness of space. Uh, he didn't say this, but, but here, here is what I was hearing as, as he was sharing this. I was thinking about Christmas, guys. I was thinking about the Christmas season. I was thinking about the Christmas story. And here's what I was hearing, that, 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 that your story and my story here on planet Earth, that, that our stories are part of a larger story. A larger story that, that in, that's, that's bigger than, than your house, that's bigger than your community, that's, come on now, that's bigger than your politics, that's bigger than our nation, that's bigger than our planet. We're part of a larger story. It's a God story. And as long as we think that our story is at the very center of life itself, it is very easy for hope killers to destroy our capacity to sense hope. It's very easy for death itself to steal from us our sense of hope. Poverty to steal from us our sense of hope. Bad politics to steal from us our sense of hope. Grandkids and kids seemingly losing their minds to steal from us our sense of hope. But if we recognize that our story is a part of a bigger story that's being orchestrated by a, 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 a big and large and eternal God, And we've got hope. We've got hope. There's something more going on. Can you just simply say that? There's something more going on. Something more is going on. Notice this text. Let's go back and revisit this text. Notice that this text about Joseph and Mary, the reading that I saw, started in the middle of a story, didn't it? Joseph, to whom she, Mary, was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided. Can you say he decided? No, that word. He decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, if you're familiar with the Christmas story and that text, you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that Mary discovered from an angel that she was pregnant, even though uh, she was a virgin, had known no man. She obviously had to break that news to Joseph. There was no way for Joseph to totally co to comprehend that. And as a matter of fact, based on this text, we know that Joseph actually rejected it and did not believe her because the text says he decided to go ahead and break the engagement. But he was going to do it quietly so as not to disgrace her. So I want you to imagine that here, it, if you got to think about this, I thought about this. Joseph is in the midst of horrible pain. He, he is convinced that his bride that he's been engaged to, because the engagement is a two-year process, that he thought was faithful, uh, that, was the, what, that was the center of his heart, has betrayed him. And yet Matthew wants us to know that this story of Joseph's pain, this story of, of Mary's pain as well, because she's losing the love of her life over something that she had nothing to do with, right? That, that, but Matthew wants us to know that this story of Joseph and Mary's pain, this, this, this near tragic experience, if you will, that they're going through is a part of a larger story. Because Matthew starts off chapter 1 by walking us through 42 generations 
of the larger story of how God had been at work. And so he starts with Abraham and he goes from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, from Jacob to, to, to Jude, from, uh, and he works his way all the way to Perez. He works his way down to Jesse, to David, all these different generations, how God has been at work. The 41st generation, he records, another Jacob appears. That Jacob is the father of this Joseph, who's the husband of Mary. Doesn't say he's the father of Jesus. No, no, no. He's the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Well, Matthew wants you to know, but this story about Mary and Joseph, it is a part of a larger story. By the time you get to the end of the book of Matthew, you know, it starts by looking back, see how it's a part of the past, a larger story. But then it looks forward, and we hear Jesus says, as he gets ready to reascend, he essentially says these words. He says, uh, now, to the disciples, he says, I want you to go uh, and, and preach the gospel to every nation, baptize uh, believers of every expression. And, 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 and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded. And lo, I'll be with you until the end of the age. And so that generation of disciples was to push the, the good news message from one generation to the next as we are all a part of a larger story. And that brings us to where we are now. You see, you get the point? As long as you recognize that your life is a part of something bigger that's playing out. There is hope if, in fact, you understand that is connected to God. Now, now the next verse. Notice, notice uh, the next verse. Uh, Matthew one twenty. It says, "So uh, here's what the writer. Here, here's what the angel. Uh, here, here's the description of what took place." As he considered this, Joseph, that is, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Stop right there. Can you say an angel? Throughout the Christmas story, the biggest story breaks in, and it usually breaks in through the announcement of the angel. Here, Joseph is concentrating, trying to figure out how to, get, how to, how to move forward, and then an angel appears. And that is the first time Joseph realizes, my God, I'm a part of a bigger story. You know, later on, you know, early in Luke, Luke takes it from Mary's perspective. And, and, and when Mary uh, is, is, is the first discovers what's going on with her, it is, it is the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appearing and telling her, you know, Mary, you're part of a bigger story. Uh, um, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth uh, couldn't have children. Uh, in, the, in the gospel of Luke, and then an angel shows them and says, hey, your struggle, your pain, this thing that's going on in your life, it's part of a bigger story. You know, the shepherds, they, they were out um, um, uh, keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds were marginalized people and former criminals and active criminals and, and people who were poor. All of these folk are mixed in together. And, 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 and the angels show up and say, listen, listen, we want to let you know you thought you were invisible, isolated. You thought you didn't matter. But we're here to tell you that, that you're part of a larger story. We have good news for all the people. A larger story. Somebody shout larger story. As long as you can begin to recognize that your life is a part of a larger God story. Huh. Well, there's hope. There's hope. And so the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child that has been conceived is of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, here comes the essence in verse 23. He goes on to say, look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. There it is. That Jesus becomes the everlasting evidence of the presence of God. He becomes he becomes the uniquely uh, relatable point of access to the presence of God. All right. Let me suggest that there are, then the task for us is to figure out how to access, how to make our minds fertile so we can engage with on a regular basis 
This eternal God who showed up in Jesus because as we stay connected to this God, we stay connected to an awareness of a larger story and we stay connected to hope. There are three ways in which I want to suggest that we can engage as we hustle towards the conclusion of this first week's teaching. The first is engage the presence of God in the stillness and quietness. That we have to find a way to slow our lives down The psalmist declares, be still and know that I am God. First, slow down, be still. Then comes the revelation of God's presence that's all around you. Isaiah 30, verse 15, the writer says these incredible words. He says, in quietness and trust, you will find your strength. There is... um, fellow by the name of, uh, I wrote his name down so I wouldn't forget it, Alex Hill. Uh, He's formerly an international executive director of a college Christian organization called InterVarsity. I recently heard him share the story of how at the age of 62 he was diagnosed with a uh, horrendous bone cancer disease. And he was told that he probably had less than a 20% chance of surviving him. He went on to tell the story that ultimately he ended up getting a bone bone marrow transplant from his brother and he ultimately survived it. Uh, He's been here five, six years now. But he talked a little bit about uh, what it was like to suddenly start losing weight and and, and find himself in the midst of this cancer that was just out of control. And he started thinking about death and he, he sensed he was moving close to death. He said he, he, he had a chair that he would regularly sit in. And he said, it's very hard to explain. He says, but as he sat in that, that prayer, slow, that chair slowed down and focused on connecting with God. He said, even as his pain increased, listen now. He said his sense of the presence of God also increased. In that place of stillness, in that place of quietness, that the sense of that God was with him, that God would see him through whatever was waiting for him in the tomorrows to come, just kept growing and growing. He says, even though he's beat the cancer, he is struggling, he's working hard to try to hold on that he has built into his schedule times for stillness and quietness because he needs to be able to stay connected to the sense of the presence of God because as he's connected to the presence of God, he's connected to the hope of God and to the love of God and to the fact that God knows him personally. Stillness and quietness is a way to move forward. Notice how it shows up in Joseph's story. It says, as he considered, speaking about Joseph, that's when the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And Joseph was in isolation for sure. He's a Jewish uh, believer, so I'm sure he had been spent time in prayer. At this point, he's fallen asleep. He's by himself. He's alone. He's in the stillness. He's in the quietness, wrestling with this. And it's in that moment that the larger story intervenes and the angel comes. Create some space like that in your life. The second way that we can engage the presence of God, which means engaging the hope that is alive in God for our lives, is in the Holy Scriptures. We see it here, right? The angel is not just announcing. The angel is quoting here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Here's what the angel says. Look. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. He's quoting a text that that Joseph would know, would recognize being a part of the Jewish faith community. This is Isaiah 714. That's what he's quoting. And, 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 And he's communicating that this scripture has come to life through the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. It's coming to life in Joseph. It is a reminder, guys, how much we've got to internalize Scripture and engage Scripture. It is, it, is, it is through internalizing and engaging and walking with Scripture that the power of God's presence is made known to us. For example, I, when, I'm, when, I'm having, when I'm really feeling super anxious 
as I'm dealing with all kinds of tragedies and crises around us from time to time. I love Psalms 23, 4. I like the New Living Translation. We know the King James Version, which says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. But here's the New Living Translation Version. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close beside me. Oh, if you can just internalize that kind of passage and slow life down, you'll be surprised. And in your moments of great anxiety, that text will come back to your heart. Oh, you're, you'll be reminded of Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. But why should I fear? Oh, you've been writing of Isaiah 43 who says, uh, you know, I have called you by name. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the fire, it will not consume you because I am the Lord, your God and your Savior, the Holy Spirit. That's how the scriptures will begin to minister to you and remind you that you are connected to a larger story. You're connected to a sense. And lastly, I want to challenge you as we engage the presence of God. We also engage the presence of God in the unexplained. The unexplained. Notice how it shows up here in the text, verse 18. Matthew starts the story with these words. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. Here comes the mystery. But before the marriage took place... While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was struggling with the unexplained. I just want to suggest to you that, 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 that don't overlook the unexplained. Don't overlook what folk are calling, well, some people will call happenstance, a coincidence. Don't, 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 don't overlook. Don't, don't, don't overlook. As a matter of fact, you want to you wanna find yourself, create space for you to be in the unexplained as much as possible. Sometimes, sometimes that means going out into nature and, and being overwhelmed by the beauty and the power of nature that, that reminds you that you're part of something bigger. Don't overlook the unexplained. Explore the unexplained as a means of connecting with the presence of God. You know, as I wrap this up, I, uh, I've been watching these Hallmark Christmas movies, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, they always shape these movies around the miracles that take place at Christmas. And as I was thinking, I realized that one of the biggest miracles in my life took place during the Christmas season. It was actually my call into ministry. And as I thought about it closely, I actually uh, engaged the presence of God in the ways that we just finished talking about. And very quickly, I realized that God was trying to get my attention, so I decided to stay at Gramlin State University over the course of the two-week Christmas break. I sensed he was trying to, to engage me. And I had a place to stay, and I had a little job to do, and and, and my wife and I, we had fallen in love. We had been dating for the first, I don't know, all that whole semester. So she went back, came back to the San Francisco area. And I knew that I was going to drop offline for about a week. I told her, but in order to make sure she wouldn't forget me, because out of mind is out, out of sight is out of mind, right? So to make sure she wouldn't forget me, I created a, a love cassette. Y'all don't know what cassettes are, but I was back then it was a cassette. And I narrated about two hours of songs. <laughs> Billy Ocean and Luther Vandross and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Stevie Wonder. Come on now. The, so, so that she would know how much I loved her, and she could play that over and over because I was going to be in seclusion. And so for a week, I'd come home at night, and, and I was all by myself, stillness and quietness, see? And no TV, no nothing else. I, I, I had my scriptures, and I knew that God would often speak through scriptures, so I was reading through, working through the biblical text, writing notes, trying to hear what God might have to say to me. Engaging the presence of God through Scripture. 
And then the day before Christmas, I got up and I, I jumped in the car to go uh, visit my grand uncle. And I pulled into this little town and to get some gas. And as I was making my way back to the filling station, uh, a young white man began to walk behind me. This is the South. This is one of those towns they call a sundown town. And a lot of racial tension was still alive in that time, in that place. And when I got to my uh, door, I turned abruptly. And uh, he, he said, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to startle you. He says, uh, are you a Christian? I said, yes. And he says, well, maybe this will make sense. He says, as you were walking out of the filling station door, the Lord spoke to me and told me to tell you He's calling you to preach his word, the unexplainable. <laughs> My God. He says, have you thought about it? I've been praying about it for an entire week, guys. Yeah, the unexplainable. And, you know, out of that experience... That is why my life overflows with a sense of hope, regardless of how uh, terrible things are. You know, that is why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I'm proclaiming that, 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 that not that Christmas, but a Christmas season way long ago, that God showed up among humanity in his son Jesus. That's, what I, that's who I was called to proclaim, guys, that he showed up in his son Jesus, and that that son died and and died for our sins and conquered death and showed us how to live these radically loving lives and reminded us that we're part of a larger story. If we connect our lives to him, we're part of a larger sense of hope and a larger story. Here's how uh, I return to Paul's prayer here. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because of your trust in him. That's where I stand. Then you will overflow with a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not that I don't have some tough days, but ultimately, I know I'm connected to God's story. So here's where I want to challenge you. I want to, I'm coming to an end now. I want to challenge you to join me in what I'm calling my Advent challenge for you. And it's really, I want to ask that you do four very quick things, four, four basic things. There are 14 days from now to, to December the 25th. So I want to ask you to schedule in your, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for a larger commitment than I usually do, 30 minutes in your schedule every day from now to December the 25th. That's your time of quietness and stillness. And inside that time of quietness and stillness, I'm going to ask you to do, number two, th these two things. Read one chapter a day in the Gospel of Luke. That means you're going to read the first 14 chapters in the Gospel of Luke. And as you read, I want you to pray and reflect. My friend George Henry was telling me that one of the things he does as he reads through a chapter or passage of Scripture in terms of his personal devotion, he, he, he keeps uh, notes. And he writes the notes as though God is speaking to him out of the text. That might be something fresh for you to think about considering. And then on December the 25th, my wife and I are going to send you through email uh, a very brief greeting and devotion, around, roughly around five minutes, that I hope that you will experience and share with your entire family on Christmas Day. Now, in order for you to get that, you've got to sign up for our email uh, list if you're not already receiving an uh, email from us. And so all you need to do is go to our website and go down to the bottom and subscribe so that you'll be able to get that uh, email from us. And uh, let me end here. I talked to you about all the different ways that the angel showed up in the Christmas story to tell all these different people how they were part of a larger story. Uh, let me end here. I'm thinking about another story. It's when the believers gathered around a tomb. The body of Jesus had been placed there. And they went the next morning. The body was gone, but an angel was there. And the angel says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen as he said. I'm particularly calling this out because I know there are people watching me that are grieving, that are struggling with a sense of loss. And he has risen as he says.
You know, recently my family and I, we've been playing uh, spades, which is a card game on a, on a fairly regular basis. And in the game of spades, if, if you're playing, let's say you're playing diamonds and, and the other person's playing diamonds, you don't have any diamonds, but you have some spades. Even if you have a two of spades, that two of spades can trump an ace of diamonds if you don't have any diamonds in your hand. I've always, I've, one of the great joys is to, is to watch somebody I'm playing against put down a, uh, an ace of hearts or diamonds, and I don't have any, and I throw down a spade. Trumpet. That's what Jesus does with the resurrection, guys. That's what he does with the resurrection. You see, the worst thing that can ever happen to you and to me is this crucifixion and death, is death itself. But resurrection is a thing that happens after the worst things happen. And, and, and in Jesus' resurrection, come on now, he, he declares to all of us that whatever is the worst thing that you're living through right now, come on now, his resurrection trumps the worst thing. <laughs> the fact that he is alive trumps the worst thing. The fact that he invites us to enter into that eternal life and live it out in a place of hope right now trumps the worst thing that could ever happen. Oh, yeah. Connect to his presence. Trust in him. And we will have hope. Amen. Okay, here's our opportunity to take a step in our faith together. So, point your phone at the QR code. Go right to Next Steps with Jesus on our connection cards. And the very first option there. Uh, is an opportunity for you to do what people have been doing week after week from across the country and across the world. And that is to surrender, to commit your life and your destiny to Jesus. You simply check, I want to be a Jesus follower. That's your confession that says, I want Jesus to be Lord and Redeemer of my total life beginning right now. There's some other options there for you to consider as well. Secondly, under the response to the message, I want to challenge you to engage our Advent challenge as I framed it in the message. All you have to do is simply check. And when you check the uh, yes to the response to the message, you'll be saying, I accept the Advent challenge. 30 minutes a day, spending time in scripture, prayer, reflection, engaging the presence of God and therefore engaging hope. All right. Here's the reflection question that I want to make sure you process. Here it is. What is the most recent experience of the presence of God in my life? I want you to identify that, and I want to encourage you to share it with some people about how God has been present, how you've engaged the presence of God in your life.